this is the C11 on the EQ6. So I bought this second hand from someone in the club who was trying to use it for deep sky imaging and then realised that an F10 telescope is probably not the best. That uh, was the most expensive guy scope because you put his DSLR on it and then you use this as the guy scope. Oh my god. <laughs> and this is what I was telling you earlier. So this is the power slide, so you'll like this. I'll turn that that way round. So what this does, it has different lenses. So you can slide them in and that's different powers. Oh no, sorry, that's the filter. That's the lenses. And so you can have 0.6, 1 or 2 times depending on what lens you got in front of it. And then you can also put the filters in. Oh, you didn't film that, did you? I'll cut it out. <laughs> Damn it. Hopefully that's the one. Okay, so there is the filter which would normally stay in place in there. <laughs> I'll just sort that out afterwards. So That's the filter really good. Uh, goes that way round. So you can then just slide those back and forth. Put that back in its case before it goes. Uh, teleconverter lenses, isn't that they call them? It's a really so you're there with your bino viewer, and you just slide different ones in That's and out. So, so cool. you can look in the Ryan Nebula. You see the whole of the Ryan Nebula, or zoom in and then zoom in onto the what do you call it? The the trapezium itself. Then the motorised focuser, you tell, I dropped that dust cap, it's, it's down there, and I can't get my finger in oh, no. <laughs> to go and get it, and there's like a million spider webs in there. And I keep on thinking I must go and 3D print it. Or just get a long ruler and put it I can't around. because it's... Has it gone get, right it's in? in underneath. Oh no, that isn't... And to out. do it, I'd have to take the roof off, take the walls off, to one screw the floorboards, because they no. dovetail... 3D so. print. <laughs> So I, are my eyes drawn to your um, binoculars? So these are the old style APM binoculars. So they make a new one. This is, I say, 10 years old, eight, 10 years old now. Amazing. So the 100 millimeter binoculars, there's the dew heaters. And then I 3D printed because the dust caps were so annoying. The dust caps would fell off and they would, a bit would come off. So when you put them on, they were then loose and they'd fall off again. So I replaced them and I designed these myself. So and what I really like about it, they have a magnet in. Ah. So you just go. Isn't that cool? Yeah, great click. <laughs> and then I plug that into the dew heater, which is the dew controllers over there. And then this is a, bought the second hand off eBay, Manfrotto 161 Mark II B. That'll do that bit. So no matter what height, if you out the way, I'm looking at, I can lift them up. So even though it's an eight kilo pair of binoculars, because it's such a big chunky tripod, yeah. So if I'm looking high up at the zenith, now oh, you've got angled eyepieces as well, which yeah. is a, a must when you. I wish they were ninety degrees. That's the yeah. only thing I do with it. I, I prefer ninety degrees because if you like them for nature watching, you want them horizontal because you're looking over there. Whereas of course we want to be looking up there. So I would prefer um, ninety degree ones. The teeth just slipped, so I just have to hold it up a bit. Look through the big scope, I'm going to go wide angle. So this is no good for, you know, big open clusters in the Milky Way. Um, the Veil Nebula or that sort of thing, we're just looking at part of it. Yeah. So then of course this is where the binoculars come into their, their own. And I can just walk round. And because I'm at a low power, you know, even though it's on the wooden floor, you don't get any of the vibrations. No. And you'll like this as well, this is my tripod tray. It's a really good idea. So, um, I've read about this on like an artist site. They, this is what people, artists make for their easels. Not for being bloody filthy. Uh, everything in our observatory gets covered in spiders <laughs> so, within a day. <laughs> so this is a piece of plywood, 12 mil plywood. Two holes, two holes, and then you choo -choo, and then I put a little bit of beading around the edge. And then she goes on like that. So that's just giving me an idea to solve a problem I have um, when I'm sketching with my binoculars. Yeah. So all my pencils, charts, red chalk, all together. Genius! It's <laughs> there, because you normally hear, oh, I've got to put stuff here. So th thanks to your ideas, I'm going to be busy in the shed over Christmas, oh, nice making uh, parallelogram mounts <laughs> and now a, a little holder. <laughs> so, uh, oh, here's a 3D, this is a 3D printed tracker. This oh, is, is this the one you just used in that video that yeah, you uploaded? Right. Yeah, so I made this over the summer, 3D printed it over the summer. And it literally has, I'll go and get the, the battery. So that's what I used to align on Polaris. And the camera goes on there. 
and then there's a tripod hole, you know, tripod bolt there which I've epoxied in. And then the motor turns the gears and the gears then travel and push that away and it follows the star. So you point, well the thing of the mass now, there, that's it, you point it at Polaris, which is up there, and then that rotates, that would obviously be the wrong way, and it rotates that way. Mm -hmm. And I think that cost, what, about £20? Wow. Well, I already had that. The most expensive part was that, um, buying a little ball head mount. But it's an M8 bolt, a £10 motor. Those are 3D printed. A bit of stainless steel thing cost two or three quid. And it all just goes together like that. Fantastic. So you have to have that distance. That's the key point. So for one RPM motor, it has to be that distance apart to get one revolution every 24 hours. Okay. And that is now rotating at one RPM. Amazing. And then all the accessories live in various states of odds and ends live in here. So <laughs> when the kids were, um, they got a bit bigger, this, or watch your head on the counterweights. This was all their stuff they had. And then when they, they were bigger, you know, they needed a bigger desk for their school study. So I said, right, I'll take this, I'll make this, and took this out here. So all the odds and ends live in here. And I keep the eyepieces in the warm room. So that they don't get, because if it's cold out here, if it's say freezing in the day, then you put your eyepieces on here, you just go, ah, and it just mists straight over. Yes, I, I do that all the time. <laughs> and then you have to have your hair dry. Of course. That's my last. <laughs> so the two heats are in all the power supplies over here, but just in case it does go horribly wrong, then I do have the hair dryer. And you can warm your hands up with it as well. <laughs> yeah. I think I'll say something else when you pick them. <laughs> My stool. You ready? So no matter what height your eyepiece is at, you can then go up and down. Awesome. So if I'm up here, if I'm looking at you know something that's low down, I can, well, I can either stand up or... Here. Different heights. And then I'm looking high up into the sky. You know the eyepiece is up here. Amazing. So I can have the laptop on here. I can be looking at the planets, the moon, whatever. Whatever I'm looking at the eyepiece. Do an hour or two of that. I think I've had enough now. I'll switch over to the binoculars and do that. And the best thing I find at all of all about this whole thing is that when it's like two or three in the morning and you think it's now time to go to bed is you literally just roll it back, put the dust covers on, go to bed. Yeah. You don't have to unpack all the electrics, the optics, everything. No, that's the, such a beauty of having your own setup. Apex roof, you get storage space in the roof. So I can keep all boxes and accessories and all that sort of thing. Ah, that's why your observatory looks so tidy. Because it's all <laughs> up there in the roof. And when we lived in our old house up in Amesbury, I modified an old shed. So we had an old garden shed that we weren't really using, so I modified that to put the roll off roof on. And the roof slowly started splaying, got further and further. Oh, no. So when the guys built this, it's of course it's this big steel structure, so it's not going to go anywhere. It's not going anywhere, no. It's really neat storage space though, isn't it? So yeah, all the all the cases and bags and useful bubble wrap all, all goes in there. Amazing. So we're in the warm room and one of the first things I noticed in here was this amazing 3D printer that Mark and I have been thinking about getting for ages and seeing what this Mark has done with one is making me really want to buy one for Christmas. So, so this is a Jupiter. This is a, what do you a say? Lithopane. This is a lithopane. So it varies, so it prints away, so it makes a circle and then just prints layer upon layer up. But the thicker bits are darker and the thinner bits when you shine the light through let the light come through. It's so amazing. So you've got the great red spots and the different belts and tropical zones and equatorial belts. So I thought having it on a rotating base. Yes, with a, a warm white LED, a dim, fairly, not too bright, and that would you look like, like a Jupiter. Like yeah, definitely. So I followed Starting Mars <laughs> last year. So I printed off a globe of Mars, but I then tried to put this bit on. Anyway, what I've done is I've painted it orange and what I need to do is get the graphite pencils out or charcoal pencils and add on the dark mm. markings. But it's one of those things where I sort of get to that stage and then move on to another project. So, so when you see the Olympus Mons on there you really get a sense of just how huge that volcano yeah. is relative to the rest of the globe. Yeah, that's Mariner Valley there. So yeah you got the things like where is it? 
the hell that's an impact basin so that's on like on the moon you get those huge impact basins so i'll put him down there so he doesn't roll off <laughs> so we've got apollo that's the apollo 15 landing site so that's hadley bay so that's a hadley rile it's like river that comes across the the moon there's a, a volcanic vent down here somewhere and the astronauts actually came in over the mountains and then landed just on where it bends just that apex of that bend amazing so this is tharsis the tharsis volcanic region on mars so there's one two three four six volcanoes on, on the surface of mars and this is the start of the mariner valley so the volcano is lifted up and then that's what ruptured the surface of Mars. And somewhere in there, I've got a photograph of a, of a cloud forming over Arcea oh, Mons. Oh, wow. If you bear with me, I'm doing the show, don't tell. <laughs> so that is the plan. So that is Olympus Mons. Uh, yes, you can see it just going across. And then you can see here this white belt oh, yeah. forms. And that is a cloud over Arcea Mons. So if you look at that, they're the same height. So I want to take these down to the shop and get them get yeah. them framed together. So I took that from from the observatory last autumn. Amazing. So these are my photos. So I love this. This is what I love about amateur astronomy. That's my photograph of Mars taken in that telescope. You know. And you've and got that, a cloud on another planet. A cloud on another planet. And <laughs> what's so cool is that I went I went to work after taking this. And he said, oh, morning, Mark, how are you this morning? I said, oh, I said, okay. I said, I've been photographing volcanoes in my garden. I said, what do you mean you've been photographing? <laughs> oh, sorry. I said, they were on another planet. Yeah, it uh, blows people's minds, doesn't it? This is quite cool as well. This is the Apollo 11 landing site. So this is Apollo 11. So it landed right in the centre. And if you look it up on, online, these are the names of features that the astronauts used to navigate in so you've got cat's paw crater <laughs> and that's called um highway one and then they came in to land just there so that's the apollo 11 landing site that's ballast marine it's all done on the 3d printer in different zones and different topographies and i've just printed this one off the other day but i haven't got around to painting it yet and that is the um Alp, Alps, is it the Alps? Plato and... I just got to look on my, my news map. The Al, 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 Alpine Mountain region. Oh, um, yeah. And that's Plato at the top. So you get that riff valley. If I squeeze behind it, the light off. Uh, oh, that really yeah, shows so the relief, it. doesn't it? And so, yeah, I mean, if I move it like that, that looks like a photograph now, doesn't it? Does, it does, yeah. And if I tilt it up, you get the different Terminator effects. If the shadows get longer and longer. Amazing. And you go towards full... But that's so cool, isn't it? It's amazing. So what I do is I cover these with um, polyurethane varnish. So it's like, you know, you've got varnish from B&Q. And it gets rid of all these little steps. It sort of acts like a little bit of a resin. Oh, it sort of self-levels. On... Yeah. And you've got to peel off all these annoying bits because it's where the printer goes back and forth. So it takes ages to sort of scratch them off with your fingernail. Worth it, though. <laughs> and then I'll paint this all, you know, a grey colour. And then, yeah, that's, that's yeah, good enough to display. And then... You know, if you've got the lights off in here and the lights coming through the window, you get this sort oh, of cool, yeah. dramatic effect. <laughs> That's so cool. So here's, here's another one in here. So I went to the New Scientist Live a few years ago and I met... It's cold, it's cold it? today yeah. and we can't, <laughs> we can't grip thin things. So that's the Apollo 11 landing site. So... You can actually see. Let me stretch across you. So you've got the one, two, three craters. Oh, one, two, ah, three. Ah, right, yes. That there is this here, this, this rift, or whatever you call it, this scarp, whatever you call it. And then you have, yeah, that crater up there. So I can't remember which one it is, but it's Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins are these craters Amazing. When, they, when they landed on the moon and ah oh, here it is this is what i was looking for so that's taken again with the telescope you know in the garden and that is the apollo 15 landing site 
which is the wrong way around, that's it. So if I get that model back down. So these are all my photographs. So they're not downloaded from a website, these are my Your photographs. Your actual photos. Yeah. And so you can <laughs> see that's that crater there, which is that crater there. Yeah. It comes northeast round the mountain and then turns away round that massive, which is that one there. It's funny, I was experiencing the crater dome illusion then looking at this through the screen. Then one of those craters looked like it was a little mountain. Yeah, really? Oh, are they <laughs> they, Yeah, my brain keeps reversing them. Oh, where's the actual picture itself? So that's those two, that's those two. So that was Mars last year and it started off very small. And then I photograph it get larger and larger and larger and then of course we go past our position it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and that's when I break my foot and I can come up oh. to the end there, which is... <laughs> right I've got one more picture and I can't find it. Ah oh, there it is. You can even see it for looking right. And I met Al Warden. Oh he's amazing isn't yeah, he? Yeah and the late Al Warden unfortunately sadly, he's passed yes. away isn't he? I so, loved him. So he was he was at the New Scientist Live exhibition when I went there. So I want to get these framed and mounted. So I've then got yeah, my together. photograph, my model, and, and someone wow. who's actually, well, he didn't go down, he stayed in orbit, but the mission, when he was the command module pilot, when they landed just there. So yeah, so 3D printer, when it's not busy making barn door trackers, <laughs> it's also making models of the lunar surface. And you know, was, these are, are really great things, as we were talking about earlier, for people that have visual impairment, because they can actually feel what the lunar surface oh, of course, yeah. looks like in a sense because they can feel it with their fingers and yeah I mean looking at that the deep scarp there it just you can really get a sense of how huge that canyon yeah. is if you run your fingers along it so you get to, I love looking do things like that where you tilt it at an angles if you're coming into land yeah oh it's a project for you make a little video of you flying in over that uh... well I did think of making getting a little camera putting it on a lever yeah. And then just lifting it up and saying, oh, you know, but you could then play the Apollo <laughs> landing video in the background, yeah. get the audio. That'd be really fun to do. I love the, you know, the different terrains and textures. They just look so good, don't they? See, th this is a, an easier way of doing it than the model I made using liquid latex paste and sculpting <laughs> yeah. it by hand. <laughs> I, I took the, we made a model of the solar system. The picture's all blurry now, so that's my daughter. I'll put my hand over because it's the other kids. That's Catherine when she was small. She'll be horrified if this is up. But we've got different marbles for different sides of the planets. Oh. And that's the sun. So you realise how big the sun is. So we painted that with the cardboard and then put the models. Just put to show that. how small they are. I'll, I'll blur that out. Oh, thank you. Yes. So that's the sun and the planets to scale. But obviously the distance isn't to scale, but otherwise these would be inside the sun so you have mercury venus earth mars then there's a gap so you can see that bit there we got some grit and that's oh, the, grit the asteroid for, belt yeah asteroid belt so they weren't very pleased that they had to clean this up <laughs> so you can see the asteroids there mars earth oh the moon and the earth and each child had to there's a card so each one had to you know there's a little fact on the back about mercury a little fact about and then they had to put it at the correct distance and then all the way out to little pluto and then because there's like 30, of course, there's only nine, ten, you know, nine planets plus the Pluto and the asteroid belt and all that sort of thing. So we had to do like space probes and Ganymede and all the, the Earth's <laughs> moon and stuff. So they, everyone had a, a little card with a fact to read out. Brilliant. So I, for Sky at Night over the summer, I wrote an article showing you how to lay out a solar system in your garden with the distances to scale. Uh, well. And it was impossible to do the distances and the sizes to scale. Otherwise, you'd have had something that was the size of a virus. Yeah. <laughs> Mercury, you know, it was just so crazy. Oh, it's a bit dusty. Right. So, so this is your meteorite collection. So this is the meteorite. So that's a piece of the moon from this chap does all the shows you know Astro yes I, I'm oh. so that's we, my moon meteorite. most of our meteorites have come from Martin <laughs> so I love that as a piece of the moon I hope it is a piece of the moon you know. <laughs> if it's come from him it yeah. will be <laughs> so he signed it to you know with its certificate and I didn't realize that the name Tatooine from is that how you say it Tatooine Tatooine, I think. Tatooine from um, Star Wars was based on this village in Africa and there was a meteorite fall but it's actually from the asteroid Vesta and George Lucas when he was writing the film heard of the read of the paper of the asteroid fat and then named his planet in Star Wars. 
Vesta was the first asteroid I ever took a picture of, so I've got a little piece of Vesta at home. Oh, yeah, nice it's very one. special. <laughs> so it's cool, isn't it, when you when you see it crossing the sky and you say, "Well, I actually got a piece." I've got a piece of it. Of it. And it's amazing that the geochemists know that it's. Yes. That blows my mind. So they must know it then from its spectra, from its reflectivity. Um, they do a lot of studying of its composition and radio isotope re ratios and stuff like that. But you wouldn't know that until you got your, until your first sample, <laughs> haven't you? So this is an iron meteorite. This is a Sikoti Allen, which is somewhere in the so in Russia, isn't it? The former Soviet Union, Eastern Siberia, Russia, twelfth of February, nineteen forty-seven. So that one will feel quite at home in today's temperature. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know if you can hold that with your hand. Feel how heavy that is. This is filming while holding. So it's iron, so it's, it's really dense. Really, really heavy. That's cool, isn't it? And that's where Very it melted. So it's all smooth on one side. Melt. And that was the bit that melted through the atmosphere. And you get little bubbles. That's where, it, uh, uh, you know, a little pool melts as it, came through, as it melted in the atmosphere. So the body that gave us this asteroid must have been a certain size because it had a liquid core for the iron to fall to the center for it then to be broken up again to then fall onto the earth as, an ast as a meteorite. That's amazing. So yes yeah, so the body of that must have been a certain size for, for it yeah, to go liquid to, in the to core. to kind of have a liquid core at the middle so it must have been a pretty spectacular collision to have broken that yeah. apart how many million years ago that was yeah and this is a tektite which i've lost its card for but this is a piece of the earth that was then hit by a meteorite goodness knows when and then this this piece melted was blasted out re-entered the atmosphere and fell kilometers away from from the from the impact site itself amazing so we've got the original impactor or the survivor and that's a piece of the earth's crust that's been melted in the impact piece of the moon and a piece of Vesta. Amazing. When I visited you the other day, this is my old laptop bag with all the sketching kit goes in. I went out and bought my sweetie, sorry, not my sweetie, my yeah. black <laughs> sketchbook. Oh, wow. So these are the practice ones. So that's where we, we met last time, didn't we? You did yeah. Dumbbell. And um, oh, M11, the Wild Duck Cluster. And then I did a sketch of the Andromeda Galaxy through the C11. Which means it's a tiny part of the Andromeda Galaxy. Yeah, so the Andromeda Galaxy would be out here. So yeah. that's the nucleus, that's the core. Yeah. That's M32, which is one of the satellite galaxies. And then you can just see, if you go down a bit, you can see the bright star cloud NGC 206. Amazing which is a star cloud, a bit like, you know, the Scutum star cloud or the Sagittarius star cloud in the other galaxy. Are you enjoying the black paper? Definitely, I am. It's much, it's, I'm trying to get practice a bit more. So that sketch from a photograph, so that's not my sketch. But my field of view, I would say, this is, what, this is what the good thing about having that thing. So my field of view with the 0.7 is about that. Yeah. One times it's about that. And then at two times, it's about that. <laughs> so it's really cool. So you can go, from, you know, zoom in further and further and further. So that's the Beautiful. that was a practice sketch. These are at the eyepiece. These two, these are two planetary nebula, M57 the Ring Nebula and M76 the planetary nebula in Perseus. It's like a little peanut. I love the blendability of pastels. It's, it gives you a softer effect. This one. That's the Orion Nebula sketched at the Star Party. So that's with oh, my nice. borrowed 80 millimeter refractor. I love that sort of size refractor. It gives you such a big field of view, but if you get a decent one, you can get some amazing pictures as well. Yeah. So, yeah, so you trade a lot of aperture, you get a very wide field of view. So this is the North American Nebula in ah, Cygnus. Ah, you actually managed to do so it I did it. The yeah, that's with the big, big binoculars, eyepieces. It greatly enhanced yeah. the U UHC filter. Okay. Uh, but it's quite hard to see. It's very faint. So I, it, it looks fainter in the eyepiece than it does. Here. Yeah, I couldn't find it at all visually. <laughs> so you and, did but better what than I did me. really notice, so I've, I had to draw this bit with black charcoal, is the gradient. This bit's black and this bit's like almost black, but you can see that change Just in the gradient. Of... And then this that's the Cygnus wall, and that's the bit that you could see, you know, you could see with direct fishing. Yeah. And I, I called this, this was the Orion asterism. Oh, yeah. 
and that's why you use to, to reference him. It's really good to find patterns like that when you're drawing a star field. And that is with the binoculars again. So that's the I was always going to, I always being a bit cheapskate, I was gonna put another sketch in on this half. But I think in future I'm just gonna do one sketch per page. So that's in November. That's M thirty eight and NGC nineteen oh seven, so two open clusters. So and I've always wondered Sky Safari cool everything has a nickname. Mm. And I always think, why is it called the Starfish Cluster? It's ridiculous. It's M38. And then, of course, you look at it through the eyepiece. Like, <laughs> yeah. oh, that's why it's called the Starfish Cluster. They do it? look very different on photos. That really does look like a starfish. But you've got these long arms coming off. And then, so and I'm the using texture. the pastel pencil to lay everything out. Then I use the ink gel pencil and add on the brighter stars. Yeah. Then use the pastels to then, you know, fine tune the nebulosity and. It works really I, I well. I really love working in pastels. Uh, that's M1, that's a crab nebula. Oh gosh, that's, an, so it's just... that's a faint object. Did I, I heard um, that if Messier had been looking today he wouldn't have found that because oh, it's really? expanded and faded so much since oh, really? he found it. With his little telescope? Yeah, um, the Fawkes telescope has exactly the same field of view as the, um, the Hubble and Pete Williamson, who's the imaging director for Forks, actually put together an animation of the Crab Nebula taken by Hubble versus taken by the Forks recently. Oh, and you really? can completely see how it's expanded and oh, faded. Wow. So yeah, it wouldn't be within the realms of his equipment if he was looking for it now. Really? So we just too diffuse. Yeah. That's that... what I I heard. I don't know if it's true. Yeah. So that's the that's the sketching kit. So I bought that was when I met you the other day, or the month now. It's a while ago now. Yeah, isn't it? so back in was it August or September? So I went out and bought that and the, the book itself. Blending stump. And this is I'll, I can't remember if I had this before, but I showed you this before. That's yes, the, the retractable and eraser. Rubber. Yeah. Eraser. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, you can't call it a rubber, otherwise the Americans will start laughing at us. <laughs> So yeah, that's it. It's amazing. So this all lives in, in the war room just because it gets so damp in the observatory. Yeah, so. it doesn't blend very well if you've got damp on your paper. Oh, thank you for showing me those. I'm glad yeah, you're enjoying the black paper given that you went and bought it because of me. <laughs> that's the pocket skylight. So this is 15, 16 years old. So, and it, as you can see, it's battered beyond belief. But because it's all printed in this sort of laminated plastic paper. The actual charts themselves They're all fine. are absolutely fine. So this is a really nice size because that fits in my binocular case. Yeah. So if I'm away with business or we're away with family, then that will go inside the case. And I literally have my binoculars and the star chart, a little notebook, pencil, and that would be my going away. And because they're image stabilized binoculars, and the image stabilized ones, the, you don't need to take a tripod. No, that's good. So that was my, that's my really lightweight grabbing Because your, your new book isn't going to fit in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank oh. you for showing me around. Yeah, we feel like we're in Siberia right now, so we'll call it a day and go and warm up. <laughs> and it looks like you're about to sit on my Arctic trousers. Yes, I, it, no, there are none. Um, <laughs> they might fall in my bag. <laughs> thank you so much.